Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I'm Mark Alfano. I'm a philosopher at Macquarie University and Delft University of Technology. Uh, and this is a paper that uh, I co-authored with Suresh Venkata Subramanian, who's a computer scientist at Utah. Um, we got to this idea because I organized a workshop on the right to explanation uh, at uh, the Ziff in Bielefeld a year and a half ago. And um, I invited both philosophers and computer scientists uh, to this workshop. And one of the things that came out uh, was that there are some really interesting structural similarities between the ways that philosophers think about counterfactuals and the ways that computer scientists think about counterfactuals. So in philosophy, one uh, area of study is what, it, what makes for an explanation. And explanations are often contrastive. So when we explain why x happened, we usually explained why x rather than y happened. And Suresh pointed out that um, in the, uh, the discourse about recourse uh, in computer science, uh, there's a similar kind of reasoning when people are asking about whether they have recourse in a certain situation, they want to know what would have to change in order for things to be different, normally for them to get a more favorable outcome. So that got me thinking, OK, well, why would we want recourse in the first place? What kind of value is this? Um, and I think that the, the answer is that it um, answers to a specific need that is associated with a distinctive feature of human agency, namely that unlike most other critters, we engage in temporally extended agency with multiple layers of means and planning. And what I mean by that is that you might think, um, what do I want to do with my life? I want to have an apartment in Sydney that overlooks the harbor. OK, well, I can't just go get it immediately. What I need to do instead is like get some training so that I can get some certification, so that I can get some employment, so that I can get a job, and so then I can get some money, and then I save it, and then I finally have enough money to get my, uh, my dream apartment. Um, and other critters don't tend to do this kind of means and reasoning in quite the same complicated and long-term way that, uh, that humans do. Um, but in order to engage in this kind of reasoning, uh, there are certain requirements, namely foreseeability, understandability, and corrigibility and stability of the system in which we operate. Um, and I think that this kind of thing, th those kinds of things are undermined by the growing precarity that people face in today's society, namely that um, they often can't predict uh, the way that their life is going to turn out. In many cases, they face unfavorable decisions from bureaucracies and algorithms that knock them off of uh, some intermediate step in this kind of means and uh, planning and reasoning. Um, and that uh, if we're going to be automating these sorts of decisions more and more, then we ought to think about what it would take to ensure that people actually have that kind of stability and understandability uh, that would enable them to engage in the kind of planning that is supposed to be characteristic uh, of, of human agency. So, yeah, and so there's a lot of domains in which this crops up, uh, loans, hiring, passport decisions, visa decisions, tax audits. Um, this audience is familiar with all these sorts of examples. Um, so that got me thinking, okay, well, the, the best an analogy for what's going on here is a kind of um, value that Philip Pettit in his book, Robust Demands of the Good, calls a modally robust good. Because when we want recourse, what that means is we want to be able to understand why an unfavorable decision was made. We want to know whether there were errors in the decision-making process that need to be rectified. And we want to know what it would take, assuming that there were no errors that need to be rectified, what it would take to get a more favorable decision in the future. And this means that um, recourse is related to counterfactuals in an interesting way. Modally robust goods deliver other goods in a systematic way, not just in the actual world, but also in counterfactual scenarios that are slightly different from the, the actual world. So an example that Philip Pettit gives is honesty. We value honesty because 
Um, it means that an, the honest person not only tells us the truth when it's favorable for them to tell us the truth, but in counterfactual scenarios that are slightly different from the actual world where it would benefit them perhaps to lie, they're still going to tell us the truth. And recourse, I think, has the same kind of structure. If you have recourse, that means that you um, can get unfavorable decisions overturned, not just in the actual world, but in a range of counterfactual scenarios. And that means that you can trust that you're able to plan and engage in this kind of temporally extended agency that I think is characteristic of humans. So that brought us to um, one of the first papers on uh, recourse by Burke Ustun and his colleagues, and they define recourse in terms of actionable input variables, basically the least you would have to do to get a better decision from the system. And they say that the least you would have to do to get a better decision is uh, what they call a flip set. They, call, they, they think that flip sets, and I think this is quite reasonable, should be actionable in the sense that um, they should involve suggesting changes that can actually be made by the individual themselves um, and that are actually relevant to the decision at hand. So you've probably seen lots of horror stories about cases where that sort of thing doesn't crop up. Here's an example where um, in order to get a better decision from a hiring algorithm, you would have to change your name to Jared um, and you would have to go back in time and make sure that you played lacrosse in high school. Right, so that would be an unactionable flip set, and that points to a problem in, in the algorithm. Um, we have another example in the paper that has to do with college admissions. So you might think, okay, what's my flip set if I don't get into the university of my choice? Well, either I need to get better grades or I need to do better on the college entrance exam. Um, there are lots and lots of examples of this sort of thing. Um, now, in the, the end of the paper, we sort of nitpick a bunch of um, details in the way that recourse has been defined and discussed uh, in the literature so far. I'm afraid I don't have time to go through all of these details uh, now, but if you would like to take a look at the paper, um, it's all there, and I will thank you for your time.